our last speaker of the day. Um, I had uh, actually met this speaker because uh, we have very similar backgrounds, um, working on similar types of projects. Um, and uh, uh, so our next speaker is from Egmont um, and uh, basically heads up the advanced analytics uh, piece uh, there. I think one of the most interesting things I find about this uh, use case is um, I don't think there's any issue in me uh, mentioning this, but they acquire quite a lot of companies. And one of their main missions is as they acquire these companies, they need to make sure they fuel those businesses with the right decisions and right data to hit the ground running. So can you all please join me in welcoming Frederick from Edmond from the stage. So just a quick question here. Do you have a clicker or is there, there you go. Thanks, Frederick. <coughs> yeah, yeah. Let me see how I can work at this. Okay, we got the fire sign, got the reggae, we got this one. That's me. <laughs> okay. Right. So um I think Tim, you're very right about that, and that's what we need to succeed with as business. And I think um I'll give you a quick introduction to the business also, just so you can uh, quickly understand. But first of all, my name is uh, Frederick, and uh, I've worked with acquiring a lot of the companies that we have in Egmont. Um, but the past year, I've been uh, working on spreading a more data-driven culture, uh, inspiring the organization with machine learning projects, uh, but also driving some of the change initiatives that we do from the management side. Um, but deep down, I'm a research and experiment geek. And whether that's uh, enjoying food chemistry, making nitrogen ice cream, or it's playing musical instruments back home, imitating muse on my piano, or uh, whether that's doing data-driven experiments to take uh, the media industry into the data-driven age, I thoroughly enjoy that. And I'm really into machine learning right now. So I'll, uh, I'll go a bit into depth about that as well. But uh, first, a quick video of uh, who Ekman is and what we're all about. A good story catches you. It opens up your world, touches you, brings you news from all over the world, makes you laugh, makes you fall asleep at night. We need honest and strong stories. Egmont has been telling stories for more than a hundred years. We produce award-winning films in Nordisk Film and create stories in books and magazines and bring you news on our Norwegian TV too. Egmont is a Danish foundation. Every year we donate 13 million euros to children and young people because children are the stories of our future. Generate those profits by bringing people together, inspiring people, bringing stories to life, uh, to basically make people understand society through news and entertainment. And we're a, a, a conglomerate, if you will. Um, people don't know the Egmont brand, but they know a lot of, of the brands that we have uh, below that. So we have the largest TV station in Norway, TV2. They have uh, nine channels, 24-hour uh, news, uh, and a lot of uh, international football rights. We uh, are a film producer, winner of many Oscars uh, that we're very proud of. And then we have uh, a lot of magazines, uh, Euroman, Alpha Damon are probably one of the, some of the big brands uh, back home here. Books, the largest uh, book publisher in Norway, and the second largest in Denmark, but the largest uh, educational uh, publisher. And then we uh, have cinemas, uh, leading positions in both Denmark and Norway. But we also have uh, a lot of growth businesses. So uh, we have an e-commerce portfolio, seven companies, uh, revenues above two billion crowns a year. Uh, we have a game investment fund, invested 1 billion crowns uh, the past uh, 18 months in, uh, in various game companies. Uh, we do a, um, a, uh, the tech behind us making streaming platforms. So we help broadcasters uh, make streaming platforms themselves, and we sell that to, to big broadcasters, big well-known broadcasters all over the world. We own 
several, several, I think seven digital marketing agencies, and uh, we operate a gift card business that, for example, operates all of uh, IKEA's gift cards on on a global scale. So, um, so if you didn't know Egmont, uh, I didn't know when I started. So that's just a bit about us. And our strategy is to grow with the modern consumer. I think uh, Core uh, said earlier that that there are many industries where it's not critical if you take out the department of, of uh, analytics. But we, as a media company, compete with the big tech companies, we compete with the telcos, we compete with other media companies, and we all compete about getting the best consumer experiences out there um, for the media that we, that we do and the consumer experience that we provide through the businesses. So we need to grow with the modern consumer, and we do that by being user-driven, data-driven, and people-driven. And I'll talk a bit about the data-driven agenda. Um, so to be data-driven for us is to use data to connect with the individual consumer. And that means building better products and better user experiences. But we need to become even more data-driven than we are today. And to do that, we need to speak to both the heart of the company and the mind of the company. And with the heart, I mean our users, basically. Providing those good user experiences, whether that's in your businesses, consumers, or customers, or business partners. Um, but it's also the heart of our employees, basically. Being more to our customers is something that really, that you need to emphasize when you talk about how to make us more data-driven. Because you need to inspire people. Uh, you need to get them excited. And even though some cases are easy to get excited about, as Rekke told about, um, it's much, it's a much better sell talking about customers than talking about administrative processes optimization. So, uh, so I try to do that as well when we, tr when we address uh, what's going on in our businesses, and I can only encourage you uh, to do the same. Um, but the mind ultimately follows our hearts. And I think no matter how rational we are about it. So to get started in many places around Egmont, because uh, there are some places where we need to do uh, more, um, we need to kind of think about what is it that is really holding us back in our culture today. And there are four, there are four perceived barriers that I hear again and again in our organization. And I really believe they are what's holding us back. And I think they could be relevant for your organizations as well. And I put them up here. One is machine learning. That's only for tech giants. That's not us. Or we need better infrastructure to even get started. Or data? Oh, sorry. Uh, we don't have the right competencies. We need better infrastructure. Yeah, missed that. Or fourth point, data. That's for analysts. That not, that's not for us. So I'll go through for the, each of these and talk about um, why I think they are holding us back and why it's easier to get started than it may seem. So machine learning. You use and you heard about machine learning today in Spotify or when you, do, when you use Google Maps even, get the exact location of a business. Or um, when you get a recommendation from Netflix or Spotify that you just can't help. Uh, look at. And many people immediately think about the tech giants when they hear about machine learning. But as many of you know also in this room, I think what's really interesting about this field is that it's available to all of us. And um, there's an, an incredible potential to unlock with machine learning. And rich media such as text, audio, pictures, and video, that's suddenly available to analyze and get data from, which wasn't before. But machine learning is also, um, can also generate better models from the structured data that we do have. And I think that's very, very interesting and very relevant for most companies today. So if you want to get a quick kind of introduction to the newest research in the field, my favorite YouTube channel is uh, Two Minute Papers, talking about the newest research um, in a really, really um, good way to get insights into the new papers, but also the perspectives on how it's used. And uh, if you want to get a bit more hands-on, the absolute best material that uh, I've been through has been the courses on fast.ai. Um, so tried various, but I've been through all of their courses, and it's really, really, really good if you want to get a bit more hands-on on it. OK, so I have three cases with you on how uh, we use machine learning in Egmont, and um, I'll go through them uh, now. 
we operate, or we own Nordisk Film, so we operate the leading cinema chain in, uh, in, in Denmark and Norway. We have approximately 10, guests, uh, 10 million guests a year. Yeah, if we only had 10, we'd have an issue, right? 10 million guests a year. And this is a concessions area. So concessions areas in the, in the cinemas, that's popcorn, soda, potato chips, candy. And when a guest visits our cinemas, concession sales represents a majority of profits from that visit. And any lifts to that percentage would really, really mean a lot in terms of uh, profits for us because of our scale. And this is a place where we can really talk about what is the business challenge and where machine learning can really make a difference. But the ultimate user experience is personal. So when you go to a restaurant and a waiter brings you the exact food that you wanted, that's a great experience. So how can we come closer to bring our guests what they want when they want it to get that good user experience when they come to our concession areas? Because if we can do that, that'll lead to a better user experience and it'll also lead to higher profits as well. So we developed a model and this funnel represents that model. And given a movie and a time of day and a cinema session, it predicts exactly what concession items that our guests prefer at a given time. And we have many more things we put into the funnel, but the model makes accurate predictions uh, for many combinations of all these things. So the way we the first application of this model is that we promote and place the concession items uh, that we predict that the guests would want to buy. And those promotions change throughout the day, fitting with the pre-sales and the movie that's showing in the cinema to basically put the goods in front of the, our guests that they are looking for. Um, and uh, and we, we do that by pushing out an automatically generated schedule from the latest reservations up to 8 a.m. in the morning um, to, um, to give to the cinema operators to actually uh, you know, make this, put this into operation to actually move the goods and, and run the, the right promotions. So that's one example of where we use machine learning. We own uh, a fund investing in games uh, and they're very focused on the long-term business, getting a close relation with the, with, the, with the founders, but also building a community for gaming talent in the Nordics. Um, and so here are some of the investments that we made. Uh, Star Stable is a big kind of social network thing uh, for, for, uh, for yeah, children who love horses. <laughs> and then we have uh, The Hunter coming out of Avalanche Games that we own a majority in that also made Just Cause, the Just Cause series uh, on the Square Enix. But the, the Hunter is their own IP. In our gaming portfolio, we created something that or well, the fund that they created is something that they call Monster Brain. And as you can read on the tagline, your own brain is too small. And it's to say that the, when we invest in new companies, as Tim talked about, we want to have them as successful as possible. And we are from the creative industry, so we know how to, uh, how to get the creative work and the creative art to as many people as possible, but we also know what, what you need to kind of be aware of. And a lot of the gaming companies that we invest in, they have a very clear vision for where they want to take their art. But we can really, really help them uh, on the business side, getting the art out to more people, or getting the art out in a more impactful way, or just basically using kind of uh, better practices to have it more valuable uh, to them. And uh, we, Monster Brain is an initiative, and I have brought a, brought a case uh, for how we, we do that. So one of the companies that, that we have a stake in um, make the game Heroes and Generals. Um, it's a free-to-play game. And basically, we can see it has mixed reviews. So we want to help them to understand why do they have mixed reviews? What is it that they can do? That what, is it that what's, what is the user experience that they can improve to basically be more to people? And even is it a problem to have mixed reviews for the kind of free-to-play model that they're doing or for the competitive games or the games that they're uh, kind of competing for the same uh, uses? Uh, is that an issue at all? And to do that, it's really, really hard because getting user feedback 
is there's millions and millions of users, and the way that they interact with the game is very limited. If you've ever been in games and, and run the, in, uh, the chats in the games, it's uh, very much focused on what's actually going on and uh, kind of ridiculing each other, um, perhaps more than actually talking about the game itself. So, of course, they do playtesting to, to find out those, but there's also a lot of kind of inherent knowledge in people's mind that come out through reviews. So, we, uh, we, through an API, we get all Steam PC game reviews, and they are of different lengths. So the first one you can see, it's a good recommendation, talking about a lot of different things that's important in the game. Is the vehicle dynamics when you control the tanks good? Is the graphics good? Is it glitching? Uh, or is, it, is there lag in the multiplayer experience? But then you can also get really, really short reviews, like the, the bottom one, and it's hard to read up here, but it's basically just say, don't install this game, bad graphics, and then there's a smiley. So how can we uh, get insight from that, especially when you get a lot of it and you get, uh, you get it over time? Because if we have an update for a game, that might change something. That might introduce new multiplayer bugs. It might introduce uh, different uh, ways of controlling the tank that the users might not like, but that we hadn't had a chance to kind of expose to a broad enough uh, audience or that we do kind of live testing with our audience. So, or, or not audience, but, but players in the games. So what we do is we try to extract insights from all this, and that's one of the projects coming out of the, the Monster Brain. Basically defining what's important for a game, for a given game genre. Um, because vehicle dynamics is important in, in, in Heroes and Generals, but it's not important if you are riding horses in Star Stable, right? So it'll change in terms of what games will have uh, what's the relative importance of the features, but also what features are actually relevant for the game. And then uh, we find themes in those review reviews, and we calculate a sentiment score for each theme. And some of, some of the themes that is being identified in this process is things like graphics and sound, multiplayer and balance, how difficult is it to get started, and how difficult is it uh, to onboard users. And we uh, basically extract insights from all the, the game reviews that we get. We use it to advise the game companies that we have uh, for how the experience is affected over time, but uh, both exposing that as a dashboard, but also giving them kind of concrete advice in terms of, of uh, product direction. And we also use it for investing in new, new, new companies. So when we have a new investment, we look at how do they score relative to the games that they're up against, or how to other investments that we might uh, make. And then we can use the NLP analysis to give us more information in the investment uh, situation. Okay, third case, Eggman Publishing. So we're a leading publisher, over 700 magazines uh, coming out uh, in the Nordics, and we have leading positions in all the markets. Uh, and this is an example from our Norwegian marketing department. Basically, were, they were organized from product KPIs, looking at the number of subscribers, how the churn rates was, to being more organized around the customer KPIs. So how do we engage new customers? How do we develop the relationship? If they're thinking about uh, churning, like st stopping their subscriptions, how do we uh, hold them or how do we win them back? And if they, if they stop, they're doing business with us, then how can we re-engage uh, the customers that we have? So that customer journey is also how that they organized. And along that customer journey, we ask them a simple question. Uh, it's the NPS question, which you've probably heard about. If not, it's a simple score from uh, 1 to 10, saying how likely are you to recommend Mendes to, um, to another, another person. And basically, if you get a score 9 or 10, then you're a promoter, else you're kind of neutral, and six or below, you're a detractor. So, but a lot of these answers is not the score that we're interested in. We're actually interested in the actual feedback that we get from customers, and we actually, we're interested to get that at a scale. So again, we get free text answers from um, our subscribers, and they write exactly what they believe is the, is, uh, is the reason for, for they write their honest feedback, basically, for why they uh, stop that subscribing. So how could we automatically tag up all those free tech answers in a structured way so we could actually could have 
kind of instant insights into what is actually big and small here. What are the themes that are really, really important for us to generate a better product? Um, yes, so we can look at it to get a, generate better, better you know, get better content into the magazines, or that we should do something different about our commercial model, or how we interact with people at, at different uh, points, or is it some communication that we do? How can we kind of learn from that? So we've done, uh, we've tagged up 5,000 of the free text answers. That's kind of our training set, uh, hiring a student to, to help us uh, tag them up. And then we use uh, a Facebook tool uh, called Fast Text that basically works on word embeddings um, to categorize the different reasons for customers' journey. And so we can now can achieve 70% accuracy across the, the, the categories that we do. So we can get much more structured feedback from all the free, free text answers that basically wasn't, um, it wasn't uh, possible for us to analyze before. Yeah. And what the Norwegian marketing department say is that, you know, in 2018, you need to be part artist, part scientist, where you before could run campaigns and uh, take care of customer support now you're much more specialized or you have to cover a broader range of competencies. You both need to be the data scientist, or the scientist at least, that gets kind of, that actually act, accurately measures the results that you're doing. Um, a, a software guy to actually architect the system up, and a retention manager and a digital marketer understanding the tools. When we're successful in talking about being data-driven in Egmont, this is kind of what's happening. It's functions realizing how their work changes in the kind of in the, the, the world that they, they act in. So even though we're, we're, that we can we can kind of spur change by driving uh, initiatives that can show new approaches uh, for for the role that they're doing, and then when when that change begins to happen, then and they begin to organize differently and change how they um, the roles that they need to employ. That's when we're successful in actually driving the change when it actually happens out in the functions and not when we, when we talk or people have it on the agenda. So, um, and I think that's really awesome that you both through driving business results with machine learning, but also uh, seeing how that affects how organizations change, that's really, really interesting. And if you think that sounds awesome as well, I think uh, that's great. And uh, we are hiring at the moment, so I just wanted to, uh, to get that message out there. We're also looking for student assistants, uh, both full-time and student assistants, so uh, just one. Okay, so that's kind of the deep dive into the machine learning. I think it's intensely, I think it's so interesting. Um, and we use uh, XG Boost and word vector embeddings and some of that, that stuff to actually pull this off. So if you want to talk nerdy about that, I'm, uh, I'm all ears and, and talk in the, at lunch. Okay, so getting back to what we actually um, also talk, kind of talking to the heart and the minds of the organization. What is it that's holding us back? So the second point is that often people would say that we don't have the right competencies. And what they mean is that we're lacking people who have coding skills or BI skills, or that we're lacking more analyst resources. But those competencies are not really what's important to get started. The core competency requirement is to, f to, uh, to find out where you want to go, or where you want to solve. And you don't need to be an analyst or have BI skills, something like that. And I think it's really important to emphasize that to the organization because it's defining kind of the user experience or the business uh, problem really, really clearly before you start. So that's kind of the only competency that's really critical to, um, to get going. So next up is infrastructure. I think um, uh, Cole also talked to the point that um, to deliver a burger model, you need to have very, very good infrastructure to actually deliver a lot of small models that can actually kind of deliver value in every point. And I think it's, it's definitely, it's true. You need infrastructure to deliver value at scale, but you don't need infrastructure to even get started. You need to kind of build the first part burger model and then build out the infrastructure from there. So it's definitely easier when you have the infrastructure, but it's not a prerequisite to pursue a data-driven strategy. 
So we've had success with using data in the current infrastructure, finding out what building blocks that we need, and then building the building blocks as we identify them. Or to put it in another way, we shouldn't make roads until we know where to go, but you need to find out exactly where to go first. And the last one, people say data, that's only for analysts. And I think today, when a lot of uh, departments need some insights, they go to their analysts. But to be data-driven, it's about everyone being able to make database decisions. And that's not possible if you think that data is only for analysts. And even if you do think that, then it's not possible to hire enough analysts to actually give you all the insights that you need. So you need to democratize access to data. You need to give everyone access to the data. So everyone can, everyone can be an analyst. Everybody can find those insights that unlock value in their business. And a great place to start for many businesses is to start with the monthly report, because often there's a business report being sent out every month to managers. And to do those aggregate figures for management, you actually sum up a lot of the kind of underlying numbers. And just the market starting with kind of supplying that in a dashboard tool, giving everybody access so they can drill down, it's actually relevant to a lot more people than what, uh, what is being done today a lot of places. Um, and it's a great place to start because you already have the infrastructure um, available to actually make those monthly reports. So you can kind of leverage uh, all the, the way that you're gathering data today and just expose it to a lot more users. And that will also make people more able to make data-driven decisions rather than waiting for those set an analysts. Hmm? So I started saying out that it was easier than many people think to get more data-driven. And I think if you talk to the beliefs that, are, that people uh, have and what's holding them back, I think that can really uh, help unlock you know, getting uh, farther along on the data-driven journey. And just going backwards through my presentation. So I think you need to democratize access to data, use data in your current infrastructure, find out what insights will unlock value, and the fact that machine learning is available to all of us. So if you can get people to remember that, then I think it is much easier than it could seem. Thank you. Fred, uh, can, I, uh, can you just stay there for a moment? Uh, you had one question which I thought was really interesting. I can remember this one off the top of my head. Mm -hmm. uh, it was something around, uh, uh, you have so many brands. Mm. How siloed are you so Egmont, as a business? Yeah, Egmont is, has a conglomerate structure. So we're very decentralized. And that's been part of our kind of success. Mm. And that also means that we, are, we work in a very siloed fashion today. Um, and I think, I mean, I've been involved in projects also, kind of, for example, the digital marketing department between TV2 and publishing. Yeah, I helped kind of meld them together. And so I think there's a lot of kind of positive development happening. Yeah. But we're working in a, a business environment where we have to help each silo on their own and then begin to, to share experiences between the silos that look, look like each other. Perfect. Thank you very much, Fred. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, I am hungry, as I'm sure many of you are. I would like to uh, finish off this by first of all thanking all our speakers for being here. I know that the three core things that I learned were, and they were the main themes that resonated everywhere as well, which is the first, we need to do something about putting in the proper foundation in place. The second was, have use cases in mind of what you actually want to achieve. And the final was that it really needs to be, first of all, driven and triggered from above to enable the rest of the company to uh, bring on a data culture that would allow a company to be data driven. So with that, I want to thank you all for attending the first data talks, and I very much look forward to seeing you at the next. Thank you.